abiogenesis, the, the belief by faith that life can somehow come from non-living matter, that's scientifically impossible. Before we get into how science shows that this really is possible, which we'll do in just a moment, let's pay attention to something this preacher just said. That abiogenesis, a colloquial term for the body of hypotheses explaining the original development of life, is, according to him, a belief by faith. And notice with people of his socio-political mindset that every accusation is a confession because believers like to project their own faults onto others to accuse everyone else of the very thing that they alone are doing as if we're the ones doing it and not him. I will not accept anything on faith because faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have because it means convincing yourself of things that are not evidently true and then refusing to question those assumptions despite any and all evidence to the contrary. Faith is a belief based on an assumption of authority instead of evidence. Thus, faith is inherently autodeceptive and is not a reliable path to truth. And that's why religious apologists have to lie to defend the faith. That is an accurate description of faith in the context of religious beliefs. But when believers hear that, they tell me I got it wrong. They try to twist everything around backward by saying that faith is simply trust in the evidence even though they never have any evidence to show, and they shamelessly admit that no amount of evidence will ever change their mind either. So they tell me I got it wrong, but then they prove I got it right when they say things like this. Do you think that anyone in that church congregation thought he meant that abiogenesis is a belief based on trust in the evidence? (laughs) No, of course not. They all understand that faith is a stoic conviction that is not based on evidence. Yet the atheist wants us to believe that inanimate matter somehow became alive and then eventually developed consciousness. If you believe that, I submit to you, you're being emotional, you're not being logical. Au contraire. I submit that we, we both agreed that there was a time when there was no life yet on this planet, and then there was. Science has evidence that this happened naturally, while religious fundamentalists pretend as if that happened magically. Believers make believe with a passion, yet they pretend as if it's the dispassionate who are the ones being emotional. Their apologetics depends on logical fallacies, yet they accuse us of being illogical. Every accusation is a confession of their own fault that they're trying to project onto us. Remember how the apologist believes that a god spoke everything out of nothing. So it obviously doesn't really matter to him what is or isn't scientifically possible. Creationists often lie about this too, saying that they don't believe that God created everything out of nothing, but that he created everything out of uh, himself. Ah, but they also say that God is immaterial and that he exists beyond our universe. So what materials did God make everything out of? They don't have an answer for that. And their apologetic sources contradict them, saying that they must believe in creation ex nihilo, out of nothing, Because Romans 4.17 says that God calls into existence the things that do not exist, or do not yet exist, until he speaks them into being. Abracadabra. You just don't want God to exist. There are and have been many respected scientists who also believe in the God of Abraham. But, as I pointed out earlier, they are not biblical literalists. Because no matter how much they want God to exist there is too much of the Bible that we know for certain cannot be literally true. We know that the earth is ancient, that Adam and Eve are genetically impossible, even according to Christian biologists, who also know that the Garden of Eden is just a parable, a fable with a moral adapted from the elder mythos of Mesopotamian polytheism, and that neither the Tower of Babel nor the global flood nor the Exodus, none of that happened as described. Biblical scholars say that the Bible doesn't begin to include actual historic references until the more recent books. The older stuff is not historical at all beyond some of the names and of of some of the people and places involved. So these scholarly believers interpret the scriptures more figuratively than the know-nothing fundamentalists do. When the Bible has God saying, let the earth bring forth all the living creatures, these God-believing scientists expect that God must have provided a natural scientific way in which the earth could do as God commands. 
because there's no logical way to believe that something like that could happen. Creationists are the ones who believe that inanimate matter became alive. Modern rabbis admit that the Jewish scriptures describe the creation of Adam as a golem spell, which is literally inanimate matter being animated by having the breath of life breathed into it. This is old Jewish magic. Uh, this is found not only in the Bible and the Talmud, but in much older Semitic documents too. But, but the real situation with abiogenesis is not like that at all. Religion gives simple answers to simple questions. Science gives complex answers to complicated questions. If you don't even understand evolution, which is easy, then you're not going to be able to understand abiogenesis because it is not as simple as inanimate matter coming to life, like in your favorite fantasy folklore. No. In fact, it's a multi-stage series of unrelated processes in different chemical environments building to cumulative effect. Now, I've tried to explain this to creationists many times, and I never get past the first step. Before I can show you how any of the specific processes involved in what happened, we have to start with how we know that it happened and how we know when it happened. So, here goes. According to every ounce of paleontological evidence anyone has ever dug up anywhere, there is every indication that the further back in time you look, the simpler and more similar living things appear to be and until there's only single cells. And prior to that, there's no evident life of any kind at all. According to the fossil record, there were no primates 100 million years ago, no mammals 200 million years ago, although we have plenty of fossils that were almost or mostly mammalian. And there were no dinosaurs 300 million years ago and no terrestrial vertebrates 400 million years ago. 500 million years ago, there weren't any vertebrates at all yet. Though again, we do have evolutionary precursors evident in the Cambrian fossils. 600 million years ago, there wasn't anything other than sponges that you would recognize today. Everything else alive then was too unfamiliar. So far, we've never even found trace fossils for macroscopic life forms other than sponges older than 700 million years. But we do have bacterial microfossils covering another 2.8 billion years prior to the first multicellular anythings we've ever found a trace of. Now, if we're going to be logical, then the only logical conclusion we can draw from all that data is that the most advanced organisms were still only microscopic and microbial for the first 80% of the history of life on this planet. I tried to present this to James Tour but I only had a few seconds in which to pose the question, and he dodged it. Because like other creationists, he ignores all the scientific data that is consistently corroborated all over the world because of how it is stacked against his a priori assumptions that he so desperately wants to make believe instead. Creationists keep pretending as if every form of life appeared in the Cambrian explosion, as if we don't have any pre-Cambrian fossils, as if every form of radiometric dating is so unreliable that the Cambrian could have happened 6,000 years ago. No, we know better than all of that, and I can prove it. So don't even bother with those attempted excuses. Now, if you can accept the evident reality, then we may continue, though that means getting out of my normal area. I study evolution. I'm good with that. I don't do origin of life research. That is a totally that is totally separate from evolution and not my field at all. But I am interested in the topic. So whenever I happen across a relevant article pointing out a new discovery in that area, I'll make a note of it and I'll include all my citations in the description below. What we know of the prebiotic earth nearly 4 billion years ago is that it was much warmer and more radioactive than it is today, a bubbling cauldron cooking complex chemicals. So the first thing we had to figure out is how organic chemicals like amino acids can be formed naturally from inorganic origins. And thanks to Yuri Miller and a number of other similar experiments that have been going on since the 1950s, we know that water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen generate amino acids when heated and charged with electricity. The same thing happens when you change the mix to include carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and sulfur dioxide. Similarly, heating water to 70 degrees Celsius in the presence of iron hydroxide, simulating geothermal vents in the uh, anaerobic conditions of the prebiotic earth, 
also produced amino acids and alpha hydroxy acids in the lab. So it turns out that there's a few ways we can get organic chemicals from inorganic origins. The most common critique of these studies that I hear from creationists is that the Yuri Miller experiments did not produce life from non-life, but they weren't trying to. They knew that life is crazy complex, so its origin is going to be complex too. Not a single step process, but many different ones collectively. And moving on to the next level of complexity, a separate study showed that synthetic molecules fold up into abiotic proteins. So it turns out that life is not necessarily the only source of proteins. Other experiments show that prebiological RNA can also autonomously arrange a protein producing complex. And then I read that the synthesis of proteinous amino acids and amino acid polymers called proteinoids from inorganic molecules and thermal energy created the world's first potential protocell out of proteinoids and water. Another study showed that redox and pH gradients drive amino acid synthesis in iron oxyhydroxide mineral systems. Alanine and valine, two of the proteinogenic amino acids thought to be among the most abundant on the prebiotic earth, can polymerize into peptides. Further studies show that it is remarkably easy for peptides to subsequently assemble into ordered protein-like two-dimensional structures, amyloids, from basic building blocks. Now, this discovery supports the researchers' hypothesis that primal life could have evolved from amyloids such as these. Because peptides can spontaneously form self-replicating protein structures in the presence of carbonyl sulfide. In a drier environment, say along a shoreline, aqueous microdroplets enable abiotic synthesis and chain extension of unique peptide isomers from free amino acids. They can also dry into polypeptides because some of these chemicals become increasingly complex after repeated cycles of inundation, dehydration, and irradiation. Once it reaches the right level of complexity, then if the right phosphate becomes involved, they become ribonucleotides. If ribonucleotides come into contact with montmorillonite, they spontaneously produce strands of RNA. And scientists set the foundation for applied molecular evolution announced that ribonucleic acid, RNA, an analog of DNA that was likely the first genetic material for life, also spontaneously forms on basalt lava glass. Further laboratory experiments discovered a primordial soup that yields RNA bases and activated RNA can replicate itself even without the usual enzyme. Scientists running a long-term RNA replication experiment witnessed the transition from a chemical system toward biological complexity when a single RNA type evolved into multiple variants in a complex replication system. RNA also builds DNA. RNAs have an enzymatic activity on their own that DNA lacks and is an essential component of many cellular processes. I asked a developmental biologist about this, and he said to look at the ribosome, which right in the name tells you that it is a ribonuclear protein and it's essential in protein synthesis, so it's everywhere. A recent study also revealed an origin for a proto-ribosome proposed as a link between an RNA-dominated world, one that may have existed before proteins and DNA appeared, and life that is based on proteins and nucleic acids as we know it today. The developmental biologist I was talking to then told me to look at primase. Uh, synthesis of DNA strand is preceded by laying down a short stretch of RNA on single-stranded DNA to prime the activity of DNA polymerase or telomerase, an enzyme that carries an RNA template which is used to make the DNA at the ends of chromosomes. Then there are spliceosomes, introns that are cut out of DNA by small ribonucleoproteins that chop out and splice the DNA, and some of these are self-splicing. Just the RNA in the intron itself can cut itself out. Biochemists also now know of a ribozyme that can use either left or right-handed RNA templates to exclusively synthesize only right-handed versions, solving the problem of homochirality. Then, of course, phospholipids automatically form a bilayered cell wall upon contact with water due to their combined polarity, allowing a haven for all of these processes with transport vesicles and other semi-permeable channels to keep fueling and exchanging the system. 
So if RNA and then DNA are contained within that incidental arrangement, then we have the basis of the first living cells. The scientists have even created a completely novel lifelike material that has metabolism and can self-reproduce. Bioengineers have assembled synthesized DNA patterns resulting in a lifelike material that perpetuates a dynamic autonomous process of growth and decay within an artificial metabolism. More recently, researchers at the Craig Venter Institute have synthesized minimal cells that grow and divide just like real life. In the description below, I'll, I'll include a list of other abiotic chemical syntheses or processes that are normally only seen in or associated with biological systems, but that show their prebiotic relevance to the origin of life. Understand that these are all facts, meaning objectively verifiable data, things that we can both look up for ourselves or otherwise confirm to be true. And now remember that evidence is a body of facts, objectively verifiable data, that is either positively indicative of and or exclusively concordant with only one available position or hypothesis, indicating that one or eliminating another. All of these facts that I just listed are consistent with and positively indicate abiogenesis. Now, understand that no scientific theory or hypothesis can ever be scientifically proven in the positive sense, because science considers absolute proof to exist only in mathematics. At most, you could disprove a hypothesis, but you can never prove it to be true. That's against the rules, because science is meant to be an ongoing investigation rather than a conclusion or belief. So all science cares about is whether a given hypothesis is supported by evidence. If it's not supported or testable or falsifiable either, then why even bring it up? Because beliefs by faith have no value and are not allowed in science. And while there is no actual fact to contradict abiogenesis, several of the cited facts do contradict creationism which is not even worthy of further discussion, there being no evidence for it and so much against it. Biblical literalism, uh, young earth creationism, is not only not supported and not possible either, it has effectively been disproved, discredited, or dismissed, largely by Christian and Jewish scholars and scientists who still believe in God. Even though we don't yet know all about every stage or aspect of abiogenesis, and I doubt we'll ever know everything about it. The hypothesis that life developed naturally and incrementally by a collection or series of cumulative processes is not a belief by faith, because we have instead a substantial body of peer-reviewed biochemical evidence to show that abiogenesis is scientifically possible after all, and it's obviously quite well supported too.